Good evening, everybody, and welcome. I'm Sonia Schoenfield, a reference librarian and genealogy librarian here at Cook, uh, with Jenny Berry, our local history librarian. Um, we're excited to be here tonight because uh, with this program, we're kicking off a big celebration, the 100th anniversary of the Cook Memorial Public Library. That's right. Our library has been around for 100 years. Uh, this is quite something to celebrate, which is why tonight is just one of many ways we're marking this milestone. We've got programs and events going on for the rest of the year, which we'll tell you about more about at the end of the program. First, a few announcements. Um, we appreciate you uh, keeping your video off and staying muted during the program just to avoid distractions. Um, as you might have noticed, we are going to be recording this program tonight, and um, we'll be happy to take questions at the end, um, but we won't be able to monitor the chat box while we're giving the program. So if you have something um, that you'd like to ask us, just hang on, make a note of it, and we'll uh, talk about it at the end. Um, I think that's off all so i'm going to turn off my video and uh let you concentrate on our program let's get started with tonight's event cook memorial library at 100 years but you know we have to go back a little more than 100 years to get the whole story great cultural institutions don't spring up overnight i'm going to start with the backstory the foundation if you will of our library's beginnings and then Jenny and I will take you through 100 years of library service to Libertyville Village, then Libertyville Township and the library district. Let's go back to the late 1800s, the next slide, at the end of the Gilded Age, which had begun with growth and optimism. Here's a nice little uh, view of Libertyville around that time. Libertyville was a growing town too, with a new railroad line connecting it to Chicago and new brick buildings downtown, a rebuilding effort after a great fire. There was lots of optimism in Libertyville at this time, which included hopes for a town library. Several well-meaning attempts at starting a library in Libertyville popped up in the 1890s, but they never really took hold. Now the local newspaper felt very strongly about a library for Libertyville, and they used their platform to make this blunt plea. On May 25th, 1894, the Lake County Independent published this article that was directed at Ansel B. Cook, who was a successful Chicago businessman, prominent Libertyville citizen, and former representative to the Illinois State Legislature. The article started out by touting New England traditions of intellectual pursuit. Then they said, this is a golden opportunity for some of our wealthy professional men or ex-legislators to courageously step forward and endear themselves to the neighbors for this life and in the eyes of future generations yet unborn to rear a noble monument lasted, more lasting than bronze by donating around $1,000 to the Cook, perhaps, library. Let the first liberal donator have the name. Well, that must have been hard to ignore. Here's Mr. Cook. And coincidence or not, shortly after this article appeared, Mr. Cook wrote his will on December 15th, 1894. He left his property to the village and stipulated that a memorial hall and library be constructed. But it would be decades before the library was actually established. Now, another important event took place in 1903, and that was the formation of the Alpha Club, a club for women in which they would read and study according to a prescribed course. I think they also had a little bit of fun because this picture um, has them dressed up in some sort of costume. They didn't wear hats like that uh, as a matter of course. So they looked like a bunch of fun gals to me. In 1906, Laura Skank Taylor, a charter member of the Alpha Club, conceived the idea of a circulating library among the club's members. Now the members accomplished this by donating one book each. 
by 1909, this idea kind of escalated into a subscription library, still for members only, at the cost of a dollar a year to purchase new books. The collection grew. In 1910, the Alpha Club decided to open their subscription library to the general public, and the library idea really took off. Now in 1910, we're in the progressive era, a time of women's rights, women's suffrage, and education for all. A library for the public run by the local women's club fits right into this equation. The Alpha Club had a library committee made up of Mabel McGuffin, Clara Colby, who was uh, sitting with the cane or umbrella there in the front row, um, Edith Warren and Laura Taylor were also on the Alpha Club Library Committee. These were women who knew how to get things done. They convinced over 125 people to subscribe to the library. They went to Chicago and bought 180 books for the town library collection. They signed up to accept a rotating collection of reference, science, and business books from the Illinois State Library. And finally, they got local carpenter ben Benjamin Woolridge to make these bookshelves for their new library space in the Decker and Bond drugstore on Milwaukee Avenue downtown, located where the Edie Boutique is today, just north of Studio West Photography. There was no grand opening for this humble collection of books on the drugstore's shelves. The Alpha Club Library Committee decided to delay any festivities until the time when the library had a building worthy of being celebrated. It would be another 11 years before that day came to be. Well, over the next few years, the Alpha Club's library collection grew to 600 books, too many for the Decker and Bond bookshelves to hold. And if you pay attention, this will become a recurring theme in our library's history. So members of the Alpha Club met with village trustees, and in 1914, the library collection moved to the second floor of the new village hall. A library worker pleaded with businessmen for funds for a public library, saying, the experiment has proved that we are reading people, and there is no longer any doubt as to the need and appreciation of a public library in our town. At this point, funding for the collection still came from Alpha Club memberships and donations. Mabel McGuffin took up the torch in the late 1910s by using her influence with Emily Barrows Cook, the third wife of the late Ansel B. Cook. You remember that provision that Mr. Cook had made in his will in 1894 for his house to be sold and the proceeds used to build a library and memorial. As long as Emily, his wife, was living in the house, of course, this was not to be. Also, at the time of Mr. Cook's death in 1898, there was a large mortgage on the property, which Emily paid off with her own money. Through Emily's sister, Tamson Monroe, Mrs. McGovern encouraged Emily to make sure her husband's wishes would become a reality by leaving the house to the village as a library and the surrounding property as a public park. Emily died on December 11th, 1919, and in August of 1920, the deed to the cookhouse and property was turned over to the village. Since no funds were provided to convert the house to a library, money had to be raised in order to stucco the building, build the colonial pillared porch, and make other necessary improvements. Libertyville really got behind this project. Fundraising events like this one, and donations brought money in from all sides. And the Cook Memorial Library opened its doors to the public on October 22nd, 1921. And the town celebrated its library that November. There it is, the Cook Memorial Library. At the time, actually, it was known as the Ansel B. and Emily Barrows Cook Memorial Library. Our first public library consisted of 1,858 volumes when it opened. The young Mrs. Verna E. Jarrett was the first librarian. She oversaw the first year of Cook Library's life, and then we believe, we believe she moved to Pennsylvania with her husband. Verna's employment was very brief, but the second librarian, Mrs. Blanche Mitchell, was dedicated to her job for many years. 
If any of you are lifelong residents, your parents probably knew Mrs. Mitchell. She was not only a library leader who nurtured the growth of the new facility, but she took a personal interest in her town and in her regular readers. She even lived on the upper floor of the cookhouse with her husband, giving her the shortest commute of any Cook Memorial librarian. Setting up the new library included making mundane decisions about things we take for granted in our library today. The library board set hours and circulation limits. They bought a typewriter, a card catalog, and other furniture like tables and chairs. They installed a bathroom and a telephone. They hired part-time staff who provided story times for children. That first decade was a time of settling in to provide the services a library should provide. After Blanche took over, the demands upon the library by the township high school, as well as the local population, made it difficult to operate with just village taxes. In 1924, an election was held and voters established Cook Memorial Library as a township public library. Now the tax base was increased, allowing for more growth and a newly elected township library board took over the operation of the library. Towards the end of 1929, a number of Mundelein residents circulated a petition requesting a branch of the township library be opened in Mundelein to serve residents in the western part of Libertyville Township. The western border of the township is Route 45 or Lake Street in Mundelein. Space was secured at the McBride Hardware Store on Maple Avenue, and the branch began service two days a week, Monday and Friday, from 2 to 5 p.m. in January 1930. The initial collection contained 500 books and 12 magazines, with the magazine selection catering to the needs of the surrounding farming community. In May, the branch was moved to space in a Mr. Rouse's building on Lake and Park. The library was well regarded by the local newspapers. A November 1930 editorial reminded the community that the children's room offered unlimited wealth and worthwhileness to the children of the village. A July 1931 editorial argued that the library was a good investment and it offered comfort, recreation, and enlightenment to its users. In further support, a library news column appeared each week on the women's page, providing updates on new books and urging people to get on the wait list for popular titles. The library weathered the depression years by reducing staff, reducing salaries, and by taking advantage of a small allotment from the Illinois Library Relief Fund. But with lowered assessed housing values and tax payment defaults, the library's revenue had been cut by almost half by the middle of the decade, and the library board found it necessary to ask for a tax levy increase. Without the increase, the book budget would need to be severely reduced, hours of business decreased, and the Mundelein branch closed. A 1937 newspaper article supporting the increase complained that it is difficult to get the new books without reservations a month or two in advance. Five copies of Gone with the Wind fail to fill the demand. There are almost 50 reservations at present. Ah, uh, the more things change, the more things stay the same. Township residents approved the increase in the April 1937 election. By the end of the 1930s, the library's collection of 15,000 books, five times the number of books when the library opened nearly 20 years before, was crammed into the first floor of the former Cook home and the structure was in need of external repairs. The Libertyville Lions Club took on the task of investigating options for an addition to the building. Architect J.E.O. Pridmore of Chicago submitted plans after reading an article in the Independent Register. His proposal featured the addition of fireproof wings in either, on either side of the Cook home with an addition of brick veneer and cut stone entrance overlaying the house to match with the surrounding structures. While a February 1940 editorial in the local paper called the expansion of the library, one of Libertyville's must programs for civic advancement during 1940, the project never got off the ground and there is no further mention of it in library board minutes. Discussion of the need for an addition appears again in the library board minutes in the 1940s and 1950s but in place of an addition, various internal updates and external repairs allowed the library to continue in the Cook home for the next three decades. During World War II, the library participated in the Victory Book Campaign, collecting books to be distributed to the boys in service at hospitals, USO centers, and Red Cross rooms. Librarians made school presentations, spoke to organizations such as the Women's Division of Civilian Defense, 
and participated in all registration and rationing programs. Having weathered another time of community hardship, the library celebrated its 25th anniversary in 1946. Librarian Blanche Mitchell continued at the helm through it all. She was head librarian until the day she died, suffering a fatal heart attack in her cookhouse bedroom. A newspaper article stated, until her death in 1951, Mrs. Mitchell achieved for the library a record of outstanding service and tangible results. The library's collection had grown from about 1,800 books to 19,000 volumes and thousands of magazines. Catherine Littler, who had already been assisting Blanche for four years, took over as head librarian and served for the next 15 years. The early 1950s saw some interior renovations. The teen room on the first floor was redecorated to provide greater privacy and reference material filing cabinets were added. Since Mrs. Littler lived in town in a house, she did not need to move into the librarian's upstairs apartment. This opened up opportunities to repurpose the second floor of the Cook home. The front room was converted for use as the Libreville Historical Room to be maintained by the brand new Libreville Mundelein Historical Society. The removal of part of a wall between the front and middle rooms on the south side of the building created a second floor suite for reading and relaxing while a new door between the middle and rear rooms led to office space. The end of the decade saw the addition of a new type of material for the library, microfilm, when copies of Libreville newspapers from 1894 through December 1958 were donated as a memorial to Frank H. Just, the publisher of the local paper for decades. This decade also saw the introduction of Cook Memorial Library's first bookmobile, which started service the first week of March 1958. And we have this article, but also a color picture of that bookmobile. Even with the new space on the second floor, book storage added to the basement and the attic, and the 1963 relocation of the children's department to a storefront across the street in the public service building, the Cook House was bursting at the seams. Here are a few photos of the library in the late 1960s. On the left, we're looking into what is today the Cook House dining room. And on the right is the foyer featuring the card catalog and a magazine rack. Initial discussions concerning library expansion had begun in 1957 when architectural firm Cohn and Dornbush presented preliminary plans for more space. In one version of the plans, the main entrance was off of Cook Park and the Cook home remained firmly incorporated in the new library. Slightly modified plans were first unveiled to the public in May 1961. Plans continue to evolve and in November 1966, residents approved a referendum to fund the expansion, which was also helped by a federal grant. While working on the library expansion, the Cook Library joined the North Suburban Library System, which provided district residents with expanded services. Construction began in late 1967 with new head librarian William Sanawald at the helm. Mrs. Littler had retired in 1966. The building was dedicated in November 1968. Bill Sanawal resigned to accept the position of director of the Minneapolis Public Library. Fred Byargo, I'm sorry, Byargo, seen here on the far left, became the new director and one of his first duties was managing the move to the new building. In November of that year, library employees, board members, Boy Scouts, and other volunteers formed a human chain to pass books from the Cook House to the new library. The library continued to use the first floor of the Cook House for book preparation for the bookmobile and for meeting room and display space. The second floor was turned over to the Liberville Mundelein Historical Society. Well, you can just imagine how excited the community, not to mention the library staff, were about this spacious new library. The children's room seen here was reunited with the rest of the library. It was located where the fiction room is today with big windows overlooking Cook Park. There was plenty of room for the collection of books, magazines, and newspapers, and there was plenty of room for reading and studying. Once settled into the new building, library staff continued to expand services and the library's boundaries changed as well. In the 1970s, 
the service boundaries changed from a township library to a district library. Now, at first, the district, the library district was the same as Libertyville Township. Then in 1974, a referendum passed to annex into the district a portion of Northern Vernon Township, which would include the southern parts of the high school district, along with parts of the villages of Vernon Hills and Medawa. And if that was a little confusing, here's a map showing our district today, which includes Libertyville up at the top, Vernon Hills in the southern part, Indian Creek, Medawa, Green Oaks, and part of Mundelein, as well as Libertyville. In the mid 1970s, as circulation approached 200,000 items a year, it was time to install an automated circulation system to help handle all the work. Technology updates would become more and more integral to our library services growth as the years progressed. The library circulation and its population increased in the 80s, leading again to greater space needs. So the library renovated the basement in 83 and 84, which added about 5,000 additional square feet to the lower level. This alleviated overcrowding and increased the use usable space in the library by 11,000 square feet for children's services and technical services downstairs and adult services on the main floor. We even had room for a collection of sewing patterns. The parking lot was also expanded, adding an upper tier, and a new format was introduced to the collection in 1986, video cassettes. <laughs> and a new bookmobile hit the road. Through it all, the staff of Cook Library was always looking for ways to reach out and serve our patrons. We opened a library in Winchester House, Lake County's nursing home, on December 11th, 1985. And this foreshadowed an important service area of the library, as retirement homes and assisted living facilities have been built within the library district. We have continued to extend our outreach service to them, building collections at the facilities and delivering books to individuals. Well, the 1990s were a challenging time for Cook Memorial Library. A long string of referendums came and went along with endless variations and committee proposals for expansion because you guessed it, we were running out of space again. Unfortunately, nothing was accomplished on the building front, but library materials and services kept growing. During this time, public internet terminals were introduced and the downstairs meeting room became the audio visual room housing a growing collection of CDs, videos, and DVDs. We might be getting to the part of our history where some of you remember this part of the library. Patrons responded favorably to these additions to the collection. And by the end of the 1990s, circulation was well over 1 million items per year. But although materials, services, and programs were added to meet this patron demand, the size of the library stayed the same. Space was so tight that a supply closet was used as an office. Well, at the same time, Libertyville High School District 128 was also experiencing population growth and space issues. A referendum passed in 1997 for the construction of a new high school campus in Vernon Hills. The new facility opened as the freshman campus of Libertyville High School in September of 1999. The campus officially became Vernon Hills High School in the 2000-2001 school year. In order to meet demand in the southern half of the district, the village of Vernon Hills entered into a temporary agreement with the library. They provided space in their um, village hall basement to house an interim library until something more permanent can be done. This right here is a picture of the Vernon Hills Village Hall and in the basement, the interim, the Evergreen Interim Library opened in 2003. The interim library was a huge success from day one and demonstrated a definite need for dedicated library services in the Southern part of our district. On the services front, in 2004, 
we added another technological innovation by making Wi-Fi available in both libraries. Well, remember that young man who had helped move the library from the Cook House into the spacious new building in 1968? In 2007, library director Fred Byergo retired after almost 40 years of library service. His goal of library expansion had not been accomplished, but he had overseen many, many other changes and improvements. This is a good point to stop and take a look at the library's growth during his tenure. This chart from the Daily Herald shows a tenfold increase in collection size from 38,000 to 316,000, annual circulation, 102,000 to 1.3 million, and number of employees, 13 to 137. The population that the library serves had increased from 30,000 to 57,000, and the budget grew from 114,000 to $5.75 million. In those almost 40 years, Byergo had left quite a legacy. When the library board hired Dan Armstrong in April of 2007 to take the reins of the library, their charge was clear, expand the library. Armstrong worked quickly to arrange financing for the project without raising taxes or needing to pass a referendum. Armstrong and the board hired an architect, accepted bids for contractors, and worked with the villages of Liber Libertyville and Vernon Hills to secure the necessary permissions to build a new library and expand library services. On January 24, 2009, a groundbreaking ceremony was held for our new building on Aspen Drive in Vernon Hills, and groundbreaking for the renovation at Cook Park took place later that year on June 19. While construction took place, the library continued to offer service from the Evergreen Interim Library and established the Temporary Library Center, or TLC, in Libertyville. Here are a few scenes from the TLC showing the circulation desks. There was one for checking in and one for checking out because the space was so small. As well as the children's corner seen in the upper left-hand corner of this slide and the adult computers in the lower right. Behind the scenes, library staff operated out of a warehouse in one of library's business parks. On July 12, 2010, the new Aspen Drive Library in Vernon Hills opened to great acclaim. The 20,000 square foot facility in the southern part of the district was located near several schools and nestled in the heart of residential and retail areas, perfectly situated for expanding services to this part of the library district. The Cook Park facility got a complete facelift inside and out with a 10,000 square foot addition that now houses the children and circulation departments. The new and improved Cook Park opened to the public on January 8, 2011, featuring the district's first drive up window for picking up items. Dan Armstrong retired in February of 2010, and in August of that year, the library hired Stephen Kirshner, who also then retired in 2015. Current director David Archer, formerly manager of the Aspen Drive location, was appointed as the new director. In the last 10 years, the library has expanded our collections digitally with books, audiobooks, magazines, music, and video. We introduced digital studios featuring equipment for digitizing various materials and recording original content. The workshop, Cook Library's Makerspace, debuted at the Cook Park location in 2019 and was included in the 2019 Aspen expansion, which added 15,000 square feet to the Vernon Hills facility. With the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, the library has had to pivot and in some cases reimagine how services are provided. Even with library buildings closed, services continue through new methods such as curbside pickup and programming via Zoom. And that pretty much brings us up to today. As you have seen and heard, Excuse me, the Cook Memorial Public Library has provided service to this area for 100 years, and we look forward to the next 100 years. As Sonia mentioned at the beginning of our program, we will be celebrating throughout the year. To find out what other events might be planned, take a look on our homepage under Quick Links under Centennial Celebration, where there is a link to our events calendar with more information. 
And Sonia and I will also be posting on our Shelf Life blog throughout the year, uh, more detailed library history uh, that you can read along with through the year. If you wanna take a look back in time, the Anselby Cook Home is hoping to be open this summer. And here's just a little preview. This is not a complete exhibit yet, but since the Cook Home was the library for many, many years, we are trying to uh, reinterpret a couple of the areas to give a flavor of what it looked like when it was a library. So watch the Liberal Mundelein Historical Society's webpage, which is lmhistory.org, for more details about how the Cook Home will be open for tours this summer as we get closer to date. All right, so I guess uh, Sonia and I can come back on video and take some questions. I'm also gonna look at the chat. I saw some people did post in the chat during this. Let's see what we have here. Um, where was the Liberville Auditorium located? Liberville Auditorium was on the upper floors of uh, what is now what we call the First National Bank Building, which is where the Starbucks used to be. Uh, Dance Center North was in that location for quite a number of years. Did the Bookmobile go to Bush School? I can't remember. I, it's before my time and I haven't looked up the book wheel schedule. <laughs> yeah, that would have been pretty, that would have been before my time too. And I have been here for quite a while, um, but I would, that early bookmobile, I don't know. That's a, that's a good one. We'll have to dig into some, uh, some library history for yeah. that. Watch the blog post. And if we find out, we'll put it in the blog post. <laughs> um, we have, it's great to see the proposed plans. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the 1939-40 brick and stone version that didn't happen. Um, I love the current library that we have today too, but it would have been something to see that other plan be in place. Uh, here's to another 100 years. Let's see, wonderful presentation, great review of the history. So informative, thanks ladies. Well, we appreciate the, the uh, compliments. Um, what other questions can we answer? Feel free to put them in the chat, or if you'd like to unmute yourself um, and ask us out loud, feel free to do that as well. Covered it all. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we've got another, uh, the same person is asking about Bush School. Um, yeah, we will find out if we went to Bush School. Um, it seems like that would have been a logical place for it to go kind of out uh, in that direction, but we'll have to find out. We have a question about next steps, more plans. Well, Sonia and I are uh, genealogy and local history librarians. We are not library administration. <laughs> so uh, we can't, we don't really have any plans that we can show you uh, or share. Of course, we would love for uh, library service to return to pre-COVID times um, personally, uh, but we'll see when that's gonna happen. And I think we do know that one uh, short-term improvement uh, is fingers crossed in the works that we are um, looking into getting a drive up window at Aspen Drive. That is the uh, word. Aspen Drive Library. So um, I heard some people talking about that. Um, it's hard to know. I, I think it was interesting, the technological uh, developments that have happened in the you know last 30 to 50 years and um, with things changing so rapidly, it's hard to know what will happen. Um, but I, I hope that part of our presentation besides you know the changes in the building and the changes in the district boundaries have um, one thing that has remained um, pretty much constant is the desire to serve the members of the public in our district and um, to the best of our ability. So, uh, it's my sincere desire to keep doing that as long as I'm here. So at least hopefully you'll be able to count on that. Um, we have a question. Is this presentation going to be available for others to watch? Um, we are recording it. We're not sure how it's going to be posted or distributed yet, but it is being recorded. So uh, it should be available at some point um, for, for others to watch. Um, wasn't there a talk a long time ago about the library being moved to the Brainerd building? Uh, that was one of the proposals for the Brainerd building. Uh, Sonia, you were here when that was happening. I don't know if, if you have, uh, I don't know how that was, how much it was concerned on the library side. <laughs> it, uh, yeah, I wasn't, I was here in the nineties when that was one of the, um, one of the possibilities and, uh, 
what I remember was that asbestos was a major issue in that building and also that it was not built to um, hold the weight of books on the second floor. So there would have had to be way too much money put into it to make it um, feasible to be a library. It wasn't built to be a library. Are there other questions? All right, I don't see any more in the chat and no one is speaking up. Um, Sonia and I are both here at the library. So <laughs> if you do have uh, questions, um, uh, then uh, feel free to reach out to us either by email or just call the library and ask for one of us. If we don't know the answer off the top of our heads, we will try and track it down to the best of our ability. Uh, and again, we will be writing and posting some blog posts along the year. So if we find out more information than we had today, you'll find it in those blog posts um, that'll be periodically published over the next six months. One more thing, um, just uh, we to show you how much we don't know about the future, uh, we, <laughs> we are hoping and, and uh, fingers crossed that we'll, we will be able to have some big celebration in the fall. Um, since we don't know what life will look like at this point, we don't know what that celebration is going to be, but, but stay tuned because we hope that we'll be able to do some sort of in-person, um, you know, raise a glass to 100 years and here's to 100 more, as someone said earlier. Fingers crossed. All right, well, thank you everybody to join for joining us tonight. Um, we hope you take advantage of some of the other programs we have coming up, and we look forward to seeing you in the library and on Zoom again in the future. Have a great night, everybody. Thanks for coming.